Um, yeah, I'm already having our next speaker here with me. You've seen him yesterday a few times, Radoslav Albrecht from Bitbond. Hello. He's here to uh, speak on which hurdles do exist for the digital programmable euro. And he's from Bitbond. And I want to give, uh, give up the stage to you. Have fun, enjoy. And don't forget to post your questions in the Telegram group or to raise your hand physically if you have some after his presentation. If the time allows, of course. Yeah, thank you so much. So another exciting topic we uh, want to talk about today, hurdles of the digital programmable euro. Um, and the way I'd like to approach this is to first show a bit of context, where is actually the market for programmable money? Um, what are the use cases and why is it something that we might need? Um, and then I'll try to resolve the hurdles in a oversimplification to make it a little bit more entertaining. So let's see how that goes. Um, uh, I'm Radko Albrecht. I'm the founder and CEO of Bitbond. Uh, at Bitbond, we focus on providing tokenization technology to banks and regulated financial institutions. Um, we also provide consulting around uh, tokenization-related and digital assets-related topics. And we have also already implemented technology for the issuance of a digital euro. So we have first-hand experience with that topic. Um, I'll start with a brief introduction into tokenization because that's the context where a digital euro could be very useful. It's, of course, not the only context, but it's the one that um, at least we are most familiar with. And it's the context of institutional tokenization transactions, such as the Vonovia transaction, which was conducted in 2021, um, a tokenized bond, or the European Investment Bank um, a tokenized bond transaction, which was also conducted last year. Um, the reason banks are starting to use tokenization more is because of its settlement efficiency. Um, in the legacy process, you need several intermediaries in order to settle um, a securities transaction or an asset transfer. Um, so when an issuer uh, issues a security and an investor buys it, you would normally have a securities account uh, of the investor. You would have a central securities depository, the CSD, in Europe, often Euroclear or Clearstream, uh, and you would normally have a paying agent. When you go into a tokenized world, then um, some of these intermediaries are not necessarily needed anymore. You can still work with intermediaries, of course, but um, it's not a necessity anymore. One of the ones that you want to replace or remove from the value chain is the CSD, uh, for example. The way you do that is you tokenize an asset such as a bond or a stock, um, and then it can be transferred directly from the issuer to an investor or from a um, secondary uh, investor to another secondary investor. Um, that in itself is great when you can settle the asset faster, but ideally you want to um, reach a point where the payment settlement is also done on chain. Um, and to do that, there are several ways to approach it. You could either use a different tokenized asset, so you could go bond for bond, so delivery versus delivery. But in most cases, you want to do delivery versus payment. You want to have an asset that is tokenized, and you want to have um, a tokenized payment method, such as a um, digital euro. Why? Because you want to remove the counterparty risk from the transaction. You want to have an instant delivery versus payment. Um, and when you compare um, the advantages, then there's actually several areas where um, a digital payment method delivers um, benefits. Um, in this table, we show roughly the, the three um, ways how you can settle. Um, you can have a conventional asset and a conventional payment method. Then you have T plus two, T plus three settlement time. Um, um, life cycle events such as coupon or dividend payments are manual. Then you can tokenize the asset but have a conventional payment method um, where the asset is settled instantaneously, but the payment is still settled something like T plus two. Um, you can do semi-automated uh, payment settlement um, uh, because you can, for example, use something like a trigger solution where um, a target two or a SEPA payment is triggered uh, as a result of a on-chain um, asset or token transfer. Um, so you're already moving uh, much closer to this ideal uh, DVP. But of course, the ideal uh, scenario is where you have a digital asset and a digital payment method. 
because then you have an instant DVP. So um, typically, from a technical standpoint, you wrap both the payment and the asset transfer into one transaction. Um, you completely eliminate counterparty risk, and you can write intelligent tokens that have smart contracts underneath where um, the payment settlement of coupons or dividends, or in the case of derivatives, um, we have contingent payments can be triggered automatically from within the token. Uh, and of course, all of that you can do once you have a digital payment method. And finally, the costs are normally lower um, than when you utilize a paying agent and conventional forms of payments. So there's many good reasons why a digital euro, a digital programmable euro um, is useful. Now, there's ways um, how that can be implemented, and uh, primarily two ways uh, that are being discussed and that have been discussed over the past years. One is you can have commercial banks issue digital euros. This can be done under the e-money regime, for example, so something that's actually pretty well known. Or we can look at CBDCs, central bank digital currencies. Um, so these are, in general, the two ways how this can be conducted. When we look at the market, we don't see any of these yet. When we look at the market of crypto assets, um, the chart simply shows the market cap of all um, crypto assets. Um, right now, we're somewhere between two, two and a half trillion dollars in um, market cap of all crypto assets outstanding. And if we look at the top 10 crypto assets, two out of those are actually stable coins. Um, however, not a digital euro, but a digital dollar. Um, probably everybody in the room knows Tether and, and USDC. So these are the two um, largest stable coins that exist right now. Um, both of them are US dollar based. Both of them are stable coins and not CBDCs and not commercial bank uh, issued stable coins. So what we actually want, we don't really have yet when we look at the market. Um, when we look at a broader market perspective when it comes to stable coins, uh, and this is not, uh, this is not uh, uh, a complete overview, of course, this is a selection, um, then we see that we have fairly large US dollar stable coins that already exist for several years. Um, again, we have USDT, USDC, we have the US dollar stable coin by Terra, um, and all of them have uh, multi-billion dollar or euro market caps. Um, USDT, uh, USDT um, if it's not large enough to be able to read on the screen, $75 billion market cap. Um, USDC, $47 billion. Um, um, the uh, Terra um, USD stablecoin is still at $15 billion. So these are pretty um, sizable market caps. The largest euro uh, uh, denominated stablecoins have a market cap of a couple of million. Uh, the YRX one is still the biggest with 60 million uh, market cap. So it is negligibly small if you compare that to the US dollar ones, which effectively means, to be honest, we don't really have a digital euro. If we look at it from an institutional standpoint, um, one, the largest um, uh, tokenization transaction that we have supported uh, at Bitbond so far was an issuance by Union Bank uh, arranged by Standard Chartered Bank, which was a $180 million transaction. Um, so if you wanted to settle that in, uh, if you wanted to settle that in a euro-denominated stablecoin, the market cap would not even be sufficient for that one transaction. So from an institutional standpoint, we don't really have a digital euro which effectively means that currently all of the more institutionally driven um, tokenization transactions are still settled in fiat. Um, uh, you have the situation where the asset is digitized and exists in the form of a token, but the payment settlement is either done by the issuer themselves, so the issuer takes over the paying agent function, or a third-party paying agent is engaged just like you would, you would do that in a traditional um, uh, securities transaction. So on the payment settlement side, actually, nothing really has changed so far. Um, the reason for that is there is no CBDC, um, there is no commercial bank issued digital euro, um, and US dollar stablecoins cannot be used. On the one hand, because of the currency risk, 
um, institutional investors that are in a euro-denominated world, um, they would not want to take on the FX risk of a US dollar stablecoin. And the second reason is there's a huge counterparty risk. Um, everybody probably has heard of the, I would say, uncertainties around the backing of USDT. Um, even USDC might not be a perfect setup from the standpoint of an institutional investor. They would rather prefer to interact uh, or to transact in um, uh, central bank money or uh, commercial bank money of counterparties that they know. How is the state of CBDCs right now? There is nine uh, countries around the world that have launched a CBDC, even though even with these nine countries, um, the traction in terms of the transaction volume uh, that is there is still relatively small. Um, and the European Central Bank for the Euro area is still in a research phase. So CBDCs in general are not a phenomenon that have reached significant traction yet. We're still far away in my standpoint uh, from a situation where CBDCs would be something that are commonly used on a day-to-day -day basis by um, retail customers and uh, wholesale institutional style investors. So this is not a situation that we already have. Again, there's a lot of activity um, and, and I think there will be at some point in the future a few countries that will have CBDCs outstanding that have a significant traction and that are used also by institutional investors, but this is not a situation that we already have today. So the question is, why are we in this situation? Um, the actual topic of the talk, and as I said, I want to try to tackle that with a bit of an oversimplification uh, to bring, bring, some, bring some more fun to this topic. Um, and I just summarize it with this one uh, meme that I created for this. So capital markets actually look for a digital euro. Uh, this is the narrative that um, I think we have now seen from uh, the, the previous uh, slides. Now, why is it not there? I think there are three main reasons for that. One is negative interest. Um, we have set up a digital euro with one German bank already, uh, but it's all only used for internal transactions with some of the customers of the bank. Um, Negative interest in the euro area is a big problem because if you opened up the stable coin or the digital euro, uh, which is issued by a commercial bank, then what the bank normally does if the digital euro is set up in a, I would say, in a good way, um, the bank takes the deposit for which it issues digital euros and deposits these funds with a central bank account. So they don't hold it in their own books, but they deposit it in a central bank account. This is great from a counterparty risk standpoint um, because then these funds can be segregated and this reduces the counterparty risk of those who are holding that digital euro. However, the bank needs to then pay negative interest on those funds and of course negative interest is relatively high with around about 50 basis points. So the bank of course uh, in order to make this worthwhile needs to continue uh, like to forward the charge of the negative interest to those uh, organizations and companies that hold the digital euro which means that they need to know who to charge if they opened up the digital euro in the same fashion like usdt or usdc is opened up where pretty much everybody can go to an exchange and buy it then the bank would not know who to charge the negative interest to so this is one of the main reasons why we don't have an open digital euro that can be used in the same fashion like we see that with USDC and USDT. So this is one of the most critical factors when we look at it from the standpoint of a commercial bank digital euro. Um, the second factor is counterparty risk. Counterparty risk is somewhat manageable, I would say. Um, as I just described, banks would normally deposit the funds with a central bank account, which is effectively um, has no counterparty risk. However, um, and, and for retail investors, this is sufficient. Retail investors um, would probably accept it this way. Institutional investors don't necessarily do that. Why? Because if the bank that is issuing that digital euro um, did go bankrupt, they probably could not get a hold of those funds immediately. Um, they would probably need to wait until an administrator comes in, um, gets access to the deposits that are with the central bank, um, and we're talking at least about a couple of days, if not even uh, a few weeks' time. And if in institutional investors compare that to the central bank money that they hold or to the 
commercial bank money that they normally hold, then this is certainly an added risk. So institutional investors would not really want to transact in this kind of money. Institutional investors normally would prefer a real CBDC. Which brings us to the third topic, why don't we have a CBDC yet? Well, as you all know, um, uh, the European Central Bank has a project ongoing. There are several consultations already that have happened in the past. Um, there's currently one going on by the European Commission. Um, but my personal take is, and from what I've been hearing, it's at least going to take another three, four, maybe even five years until we have a CBDC. And that might actually be too late for the market. Um, and also, what we don't know yet, what will be the actual configuration and the design of that CBDC? Will it exist on a public permissionless chain, or maybe even on multiple public permissionless chains, such as Ethereum, or Stellar, or Algorand, or Solana? Or would the ECB spin up its own chain? Would they establish a blockchain simply for the purpose of the CBDC? Would they even use a blockchain at all? I mean, there's also other technological solutions. The, you know, blockchain is not the only way how a CBDC um, could be created from a technical standpoint. And in some of the consultations that have happened in the past, um, we saw that there have also been thoughts and ideas that are actually not even blockchain-based at all. Um, it would more resemble what we currently see uh, with um, 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 payment networks such as SEPA or Target2 and pretty much an evolution of that. Um, I don't want to do too much bashing of the ECB, but I think if we want to um, see a world where we actually transact in CBDCs, then this would have to come faster than in four or five years. Because I think if it takes so long and we don't even know what that CBDC will look like by then, then I believe the market will either start to transact even more um, in, in USD-based um, stablecoins. I know I have just one or two minutes ago said that institutional investors don't really want to do that, but I think that then you will have issuers of US dollar-based uh, stablecoins that might be more trustworthy and more accept acceptable to institutional investors. You actually might have some commercial banks in Europe um, issue digital euros and uh, somehow might solve the negative interest problem in a technical way. There is approaches to do that. None of them have really uh, reached a productive state yet, but there is approaches to do that. Um, and I think simply um, the European Central Bank might be too late to the game at some point. And with this, I would say if there is questions uh, and discussions, Let's do that now. Thank you.